Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. I don't think I'll ever have a perfect cup of coffee. <laughs> it can exist for a moment. I say, well, I think this is best espresso I've ever tasted. After a few days, after a few weeks, you want more. And then you just keep chasing that perfection over and over again. You wake up in the morning and you just say, I love what I do. I'm not perfect at it. I'll never be. I want to make it better. When Sasha is getting ready for comp, he doesn't eat, he doesn't sleep, he doesn't do anything but coffee. You could hear him practicing his speech. The last four years, as a barista and a coffee buyer, first thing, it's all about creating mouthfeel. The amount of training he went through, that, that was insane. Now I need to stop talking to everyone for two hours so I can have my voice. the 2015 World Barista Championships here in Seattle. It was with great pleasure I announced the next competitor, Mr. Sasha Sestik! We are in Ethiopia, and we're going to do some cupping. And cupping is wine tasting for coffee. I've tasted this coffee six years ago, first time, and I've tasted blueberries and raspberries and blackcurrants. Yeah, it made me crazy. It made me fly to Melbourne in a coffee shop that was serving that coffee just to taste it again. I said, well, it was blueberries. <laughs> Suddenly coffee didn't taste bitter anymore and first time in life tasted fruity and got me obsessed with it. Last year I found one of these coffee trees and I just gave it a big kiss and big hug. <laughs> Amazing apricots and honey. Now, I must say this is one of the most intense coffee trips I've, I've ever done, being in Ethiopia for 10 days. You spend about eight, eight and a half hours in the car every single day. The driver needs to concentrate, like there's animals coming out. People are like just on the side of the road, literally half a meter from the car. We even saw a tornado. Locals call them dust devils. Let's go in the forest, huh? I'm looking for cherries. That's where coffee beans come from. But I want to find some really nice red ones. So what you do is just open it up here a little bit mm -hmm. and just suck it in and try to collect as much juice as possible. And that slimy stuff there, that's mucilage, that's sweetness in the coffee. Good indication to see when cherries are ready to be picked, you want to see two to three drips. <laughs> three. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I need
I was looking forward to come here for the last year and a half and meet people behind the scene and why the coffee is tasting as nice as it is. Very beautiful. They're very big as well. Yeah. Can you look at taking some samples of them? Yeah. I have not seen this before in Ethiopia. They've done an amazing job picking yeah. at this farm. We expect some really nice fruity floral flavors out of these big cherries. I'm like a kid in a lolly shop holding his lollies. Super excited. My wife is going to kill me. <laughs> I promised I'm going to buy only one, but looks like I'm going to end up with three containers from Ethiopia. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> You can spell raisins, hey? We've changed hotels, regions every second day as well. 12 hours in a car in a very awkward position. It wasn't fun. Sometimes I think coffee is not worth <laughs> this pain. <laughs> Plus, we've been able to cup two to three hundred coffees. So bonga is sort of there, yeah? Yes. Bonga is around here, it may be. So we're going there. We're going to Bonga because I've heard of these wild coffee trees in Gesha forest. Few people have seen them. What's the plan? Like, I would really love to see wild coffee. If, if people want to chill out and I need to jump in a car and go, like, I have to see wild coffee while I'm in Ethiopia. So maybe you can <laughs> jump in a car. Yeah, or we're going to go and uh, walk and, and like machete or whatever we need to do. Half an hour he can sit on the tractor. I can and sit on can. the tractor for two hours. We can all sit. I don't really? care. Yeah. Have a seat here. We were sitting at the back of the old tractor and just going through the entire forest. We've got a guard with a rifle in case of lions. Then we spotted some of the really wild trees untouched. It's a virgin forest. Not red. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's pretty close, but that's not it. We've come at the wrong time of the year and cherries are overripe and old. And that made me feel very unhappy and a little bit depressed. It's impossible for us to find the cherry now. Yes, it's impossible. It's, it's, impossible. it's very rare to find it. It's a wild, it's a natural coffee tree and it would be awesome to have a sample of that and collect the seeds and see what it tastes like. And if it tastes good, try to spread it throughout the world. <sighs> I'm gonna go home now, I'm pissed. <laughs> the tractor is broken down. So it looks like it's gonna be a nice long walk for us. Up. We were going back from a forest, we heard a noise and there was this group of people just coming to us, to us singing, dressed in all these awesome colours. They had this really cool special dance and I thought I can do this, <laughs> so I joined them. <laughs>
We are in Canberra, capital city of Australia. But this is my favorite part. There's really nice restaurants in there. Uh, this is where I've done my hospitality diploma, and this is where I made my very first coffee. We were sort of putting a lot of froth in cappuccinos. These days we would call them mountain chinos. It takes time to get used to this place because it's really quiet. But in Canberra is where I met my wife. Is where I had my kids. My parents live here. And in Canberra is when I got opportunity to fulfill my dream, my vision for specialty coffee. He's very obsessed with coffee. His coffee vocabulary is better than his actual vocabulary most of the time. Well, looking at my odd accent, people would know, you know, well, you're not even from Canberra. No, I'm not, you know. I was born in Banja Luka, which is in Bosnia. Completely different than what my kids grew up in Australia. Of course, computers did not exist and video games. I had my little gang where I was a leader of my, of my little pack. All day in the street, kids is out and play basketball, soccer, handball, I don't know. I try to bring people who can play in a team as well and let's play in our soccer or next month we're going to play athletics. My wife go behind him and put him food in the boat and he didn't have time to, to go in, in, in the house to eat normal. So I would have probably all of my meals outside. Any kind of brother or relationship that are four years apart, there was a lot of fighting. Um, all, all initiated by him. <laughs> when he was a child, he always made any trouble. My grandma, for example, would keep her eggs on a balcony outside and I'll just get the eggs and I'll see a postman on a bike and I'll just, you know, <laughs> chuck some eggs on him as well. And I was creative, eh? <laughs> Troublemaker. <laughs> Look, he was always full of love for me you know, and parents and, and everyone, but uh, it was just a little bit too much energy. Never stop. He, he thinks he can go through the wall. And then war started in Slovenia and Croatia. I remember being a kid, like we had no electricity for eight, six, seven, eight months. There was this army aeroplanes going above you 10 meters and you'd sort of need to go to the ground because they're so noisy. Everyday scenery was tanks and soldiers and bombs. We did not really want to take a part of, of any of the sides because my mom's side is Muslim and my dad's side is Orthodox. So we moved to Serbia. We were lucky enough that my brother was a very good uh, handball player. Handball is very big in Europe. It's non-stop, it's very physical. Uh, there's a lot of body-to-body -body contact. And I always pulled my brother with me and, you know, he was always joined to our, our senior team, our professional teams. And we wanted to be best sports people we possibly could, the best handball players. But then political situation in Serbia was getting worse and worse. We finally decided that we need to leave. At that time, we couldn't wait to get out. We're moving in Australia in February 1996. I think that Sydney 2000 Olympic Games, that was very tempting for us. Uh, it's a dream of any sportsman to be part of Olympic Games. And uh, we managed to get a visa. When we arrived in Melbourne, it was a different planet for us. All you think, how, how do I fit here? It was hard. We didn't have skill to work, to support us, neither my parents did. As biggest problem when we came to Australia was just English. We didn't know one English word. My 
parents have decided from Melbourne to move to Canberra. We have a family relative that has decided to help them out, providing a house. For me, Canberra worked very well because we had Australian Institute of Sport. So whenever Australian handball team was doing a camps, everything was done in Canberra. So Canberra was no brainer for me to come. Sessu tried that now signature leap. At the time, I was convinced that all my life I'm going to be a professional handball player, and that's the only thing that mattered to me. Sasha was always more agile. I think his vertical leap was one meter ten, which is insane. Three months before Sydney Olympic Games, I was voted as best player in Australia. Do you know why he's the best? Why? Uh, check this. Okay. <laughs> I was the youngest handball player in the entire Olympic Games, being only 21, 22 years old. But no manager approached me after Sydney 2000. Yeah, I was a little bit lost for a couple of years. Did not know what to do and where to go and what to look for. So I've decided we should buy one of the Hansel and Gretel cafe chocolate shops in Canberra. Sasha came up with an idea, how about we buy this? A bakery, Italian bakery, where they bake bread, cakes, everything from scratch. And I said, Sasha, you're, that's ridiculous. Like, who's going to make the bread? Well, uh, I've told Betty that I want to learn how to bake um, cakes and bread, and I wanted to have Dragon and Maria to come and join us in the business spoke to Dragon, he goes, do you want to go in or you don't want to go in? I didn't want to. I didn't want to. I was against it. So it was kind of like that, Sasha's way, very quickly. Genesisism, done. It was really small, tiny cafe that sells chocolates and made about 50 coffees a day. And we were proud when we made 100 coffees a day. So we had no experience at all and we just started making cappuccinos, flat whites, and different coffees without actually knowing how to make them. Neither we drank coffee at a time. None of us, Sasha as well. My coffee was tasting bitter. Obviously, at the time I thought that it's not a problem with the coffee, it's a problem with coffee that we are serving in a company and we need to do something about it. The big leap forward was our trip to Sydney. We checked out specialty coffee booth at a food show. It was nothing like we had. It was nothing like we were making or drinking. Tasting some delicious coffees there, I've actually realized that there's lots of skill into not just making coffee, but also roasting coffee. I remember mum and dad telling me that in our old house, that's where he started roasting coffee. And then from there, he moved on to a little garage. And that's when Sam came along. And then he started roasting coffee for us. First time I hated him, I thought the guy was a jerk. <laughs> he, uh, he came into a comp and he stole my grinder and all my stuff. He had no gear and ended up beating me. At least he's going to let me uh, keep some of the coffee I can run at work. And he basically even like scraped all every single bean out. I was like, thanks for your grinder. I'll come and see you in a week and didn't come and see me for four months. <laughs> We work very long hours, but what's amazing is when I see Sam starting roasting at, you know, six o'clock in the morning and he's still roasting till five o'clock in the afternoon and you talk to him and he just, he loves what he does. Sasha, he had a good frame of the crew. Angus, Gus was a big part of it back then. He was tall, shy, very polite kid with very messy shoes and pants. He wanted to find me, actually. I was pretty bad because I was young and just really nervous and naive, and he just kind of had enough, um, but managed to kind of stick it out. It has been actually pretty amazing to see it grow to a roastery with three coffee roasters, shops all around Canberra. So my first competition in coffee was 
It was 2008. It was very, very scary because Sasha didn't have much knowledge at the time. There was nobody to teach him. And he beat the bullets and he says, all right, I'm going to compete. Every time I smell this drink, it reminds me of love. God, he was not a very good performer and his shirts were even worse. He had this one that was like a picnic table. <laughs> it was really bright. <laughs> but he took to comp like a duck to water. The way I look at a coffee, it's, it's very similar to sport. He's very competitive, even just when we would play soccer or anything, he would make sure that he sort of lets me win, but only just because he didn't want to make it too big of a difference. <laughs> I was not a big fan of my coffee from supply at the time, so I decided to do my own research and to learn where coffee comes from and uh, how do we actually get that best possible coffee in a cup. Have you ever wondered how coffee ends up in your cup? My dad did. The first thing he learned is that it all starts with the bean. But did you know that coffee beans are actually seeds? It's true. The seeds grow inside cherries. Yep, cherries. You can eat them and everything. Coffee trees are usually planted on the sides of mountains in countries close to the equator. Each cup of coffee can taste really different. And that's because it depends on how you process the beans. When I asked Dad about this, it took him two hours to explain it. But here's the short version. There are three main ways to process coffee. Natural processed coffees are dried with the whole fruit left on them. While they dry, the beans absorb fruit flavours, intensifying body and sweetness. Washed processed coffees have the skin and pulp stripped from the cherry before they're washed. This increases clarity and acidity, usually creating more refined flavours in the cup. Finally, honey processed coffees have the skin stripped away, but the pulp is left on while they dry. It brings out body and sweetness. Plus, it improves the acidity and flavour. After processing, the beans are milled to remove the husk. The best coffee is then sorted by hand before it's exported. And finally, a barista grinds them up, adds hot water, and there's your cup of coffee. Everything makes sense? Now you're a coffee nerd, like my dad. So I travel a lot around the world sourcing coffee. Sasha told us we were going to Central America with a bunch of coffee people to visit all these farms and first stop was Honduras. So there aren't many direct flights to these countries so there was a lot of stops in airports on the way. It was Dragon's first trip to coffee region and he hates flying. That was such a long plane ride to get to Honduras. We were all so tired when we got to Honduras, except for Sash, he was so excited. <laughs> Sash's luggage all got lost, but for once it wasn't his fault. Can we borrow some underpants? I'll need your toothbrush as well. <laughs> <laughs> Honduras is a very poor country. There's not much infrastructure. Not, you can see there's not much money, streets, public spaces, nothing is like back home. They're doing it hard. So every fifth person is involved in some way with coffee, the farmer or son of a farmer or... So we all got to Jorge's place. He's an old friend of Sasha's. There was no stuffing around at all because Sasha wanted to get to the farms as soon as possible. Okay, after asking how, how you are, it's good to see you, but after that, after, after all the greetings, when we are going to the farm. Enjoy San Pedro. For us, the roads are okay, but if you are a stranger, you can find those roads very difficult and very dangerous. Altitudes. 
Oh, oh my God, oh, all the time, all the road. It's holding for my life. <laughs> okay. This is going to be extreme dragon now. Should I walk? I, if you had a problem with this, you definitely need to walk because this is fun. <laughs> you want to sit in the back? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. let's go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh that's think about it down the bottom. Oh, thank you. Only cut pupe. He has fallen in love with, with Honduras. Honduras is just, I, I don't know how many steps above everybody else in his book. It was way different to any of us expected. It's not actually rows and rows of coffee and you go in, in a casual mode and pick. It's quite a bit of a rock climbing operation to get those beans. Hay que, hay que estar bien almorzado para subir a esa montaña. Porque es a pie. See how crazy is this? On one tree, you're gonna have like little buds ready to start flowering. You have green beans. It might make your view of the lake here. And you also have ripe cherries, like here. You're gonna go so high that you're gonna tickle Jesus' feet. <laughs> Bueno, ese día quizás sabía, ¿no? Era un mes de febrero de 2014. Eh, se nos ocurrió ir a hacer un, una caminata y le dije que, que le iba a enseñar un lugar que le iba a interesar mucho. Jorge took me at the top of the mountain to show me his view of his farm. My dad started to, to talk with Sasha. He get very excited with all his ideas, his vision, his dreams. As we were climbing up, he was sort of telling me, the farm, it's big, I haven't, land, I haven't planted much, but there's a little bit of this stuff here, a bit of this stuff there. It's hard to grow it quickly, and there's no finances and the funds, and I don't know if there's a bias, that if I plant everything, you buy, so you're gonna come and buy these coffees. And then he kept walking, and then I said, wow, look at this. I think I can help him to bring buyers and promote this coffee worldwide and I'd love to be part of this community. <laughs> I'd love to have a farm here. That was the moment. That was the moment when, when he uh, decided that that was the, 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 the right decision to, to, be, to be part of, the, of this community. Yep. And then we just kept talking at these insane ideas. That maybe Aussie guys should own a farm in Honduras. <laughs> I feel that Betty was like a worry, worry about that Sacha was doing that kind of uh, things. So I said, well, if I possibly call this farm same name as my wife, which is Betty, she might not hate me so much. <laughs> yeah, so I came home and said, hey, I bought a farm. It definitely wasn't a normal conversation, like, oh, you know, this is what's happening, there's this place, it's a good opportunity, ta -da. nothing like that. It was like, yeah, how was your day, what's happening, ta -da -da. oh, by the way, yeah, we bought a farm. And then he continued on to something else. And I kind of wanted to give her a couple seconds because I knew his first instant reaction is like, come on, like, this is a bad idea, are you normal? <laughs> Like, what are you doing? You're buying a farm in Honduras? So he said, oh, but you know what? I've named it Finca Betty, so I've named it after you. And I'm thinking, gosh. So she had a few tears. She wasn't as mad at me anymore. Look, it's a great thing. It's nice to have a farm, and it helps him with his experiments and developing more and stuff. <laughs> My wife will be proud of me. Yeah, exactly. I might drink this five years time. It's going to be delicious. So now we're flying to Colombia to hunt for that perfect coffee that 
I want to use for my barista competition. And I always love coming to Colombia. I worry a lot. I talk to people and I say, oh, Sasha's in Colombia. Everybody's like, oh my God, Colombia. Not the safest place in the world. It was kind of weird. There were like five cops with their guns and everything. Something dangerous had happened or there were some dangerous people they were looking for or something. They came in like in the hall watching us all cut. They're like, oh yeah, it's just for your safety. And it's sort of, what? That was, we need safety while we're in this hall cupping. I bet Sash didn't even see the cops. I didn't notice cops until we actually left. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that one. Sasha was telling me how they need to go from one place to another place and instead of driving, which could have taken about two and a half to three hours, they were driving to a completely different place and then catching a flight. They travelled the whole day just so they can avoid the gorillas. There was a lot of troubles, you know. Colombia went through almost civil war just back in the 90s with gorilla and everything. You just need to walk around them, and I've never had any problems. Going to Camillo's farm, he had this crazy setups of irrigation and different methods of processing and plants and this and that. This is a geisha. Camilo told me he's got this very different processing method and that got me very excited and inspired. Camilo told me, yes, we done this experiment with sort of small natural processed coffee in a stainless containers and I said, oh, this is insane. <laughs> you know, that's something that's been in my head and that's obviously something yeah. that's been in his head for a long time and so well, Let's do something with it. I just loved how he thinks about coffee. I possibly wanted to work with him on my barista comp for next year. I've selected Sudan Rome because it's, I've seen very high potential in that coffee to be amazing espresso. Um, because, you know, when you talk to people and you say Sudan Rome, they say, what? I mean, they don't actually know anything about it. Yeah, it's like no other coffee I've tasted, that's for sure. This coffee is being grown and processed at Las Nubes on Camilo's farm. The method is called washed carbonic maceration. Washed carbonic maceration. It's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? Remember when we talked about the three ways to process coffee? Well, washed carbonic maceration is similar to a washed processed coffee, but different. After the coffee cherries are picked, they're washed and sealed inside a stainless steel container and carbon dioxide is pumped in to remove all the oxygen. Then, the container is kept at exactly the right temperature while the beans macerate. And finally, the beans are dried in greenhouses where the temperature and humidity are carefully controlled. But why is it so complicated? I'll tell you, for years, Dad's been on a mission to find the perfect coffee. And processing the beans like this means that all the good stuff gets locked in the tank while the beans macerate. That means the coffee has more distinct flavours. It's also easier to make the coffee taste the same each time because the beans are protected from the weather. So that's washed carbonic maceration. Still slightly easier to say than single origin double shot soy long macchiato. <laughs> Can you manage it? I've decided to use Sudan Rome for my uh, barista competition. It's time to take it home, taste it with my team, cup the coffee and use it for my national barista competition. Hidenori Izaki is a World Barista Champion 2014. Hidenori Izaki! He won WBC in Rimini in Italy. 
it was amazing to have him taste my competition coffee. We had a cupping session and then after talking for a few days, we've learned that we share a lot of similarities, a lot of same values. I found, you know, very school down and neck and peach and, you know, okay. I, saw, I, saw, I saw like, I saw like this is natural process. But then when it cools down, it turns into raisins and ports and like viney or maybe brandy characters. He knows a lot of things about the coffee and I taste it. <sighs> Boom. Flavor's like exploding, you know, it's such a nice coffee. Is it clean? It's no. not clean, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, no, super clean, yeah, honestly. He's like a kid. He's like a kid, he loves coffee. He's like basically keep asking me a lot of question, question, you know, why, 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 how do I become better? What is it that you don't like about it? If it's going to be espresso, mm -hmm. it's going to be disaster. Mm. It's like, oh, I sort of thought, like, he's perfect. I think within six or seven days, we've sort of decided that he will be coaching me. So this is Sasha's seventh time doing Australian Brister Comp. But this time he had Hide with him, so it was a completely different mindset. It was really cool. Barista competitions. They actually do exist. They're basically the Olympic Games, but for baristas. You might find it a bit confusing, but don't worry, I'm here to help. Okay, in a competition you've got 15 minutes to make and serve three sets of three different coffees. An espresso, a milk-based coffee, and a signature drink. With the signature one, you have to combine the coffee with other ingredients to make the coffee taste extra delicious. For each drink, you get to choose your own beans. Dad loves this bit. A good routine shows off where the coffee comes from, the story of why it's so special, and exactly what each drink is gonna taste like. Competitions need judges, and barista competitions have heaps. Before the start of your routine, this huge group of judges walks on stage. You have to serve coffees to four of them. They're the ones you talk to about your coffee. Then there's two that check every move you make and one more that keeps an eye on everything. It looks pretty intense. My dad says the most important thing is to have amazing coffee and that the coffee tastes exactly the way you say it will. There are three rounds and if you want to win, then you have to get everything right each time. Whoever has the best coffees and the best routine ends up being the champion. Barista competitions, they really do exist. Nationals was interesting for us because we knew that our coffee was good. We knew it was exciting, but it's hard to have faith in something when every time you've gone confident down, you've just been off the mark. But this year he was being coached by Hidenori. I guess it was like a secret weapon, a bit of extra backup. Coach is very important. Someone that brings some synergy into the team. I was checking about every single details, like how you interact with the judges. You know, for example, giving eye contact and smile is very important. Exactly. So when the customer's coming to your shop, exactly. from the gate, exactly. you give a smile. Welcome. Exactly. exactly. That's the point. And the amount of training he went through, that, that was insane. It's crazy. He will call me at 10, 11 p.m. and talk about the flavors, and I'm, I'm falling asleep listening about it. You've got to remember, this guy's an ex-Olympian. So he's focused on training, being regimented in doing things, and you know, lots of energy goes into his performance. He's extremely passionate about what he does. That's Sasha. I was so upset last year when he uh, stuffed up his drinks in the, in the final round, his signature drinks. That particularly I wanted to dedicate my barista comp to people in Honduras. 
Gerardo, he was a manager and he was managing the farm when we were doing a very interesting project back in 2014. We've sort of improved coffee right from the soil. I was involved in a picking process at the farm. I was involved in fermentation techniques. At the time it was priceless because I've done everything with my hands from the soil to a cup. I've even roasted my own coffee that year as well. And I really wanted to bring that to my He was one man band. He did everything himself, didn't have a coach, didn't let anyone help him out. He didn't trust anyone. I think sometimes when you do things on your own, Sooner or later, there will be this big, terrible mistake that will eventually happen. I was watching the presentation, but I had no idea what was happening. When everything finished, Sasha goes, oh, did you film it? And I said, yeah, you were great. Sam said he was great. He'd come third the year before, so I think he was almost expected to maybe win. Everybody was absolutely sure about the fact that he would have win easily because it was much better than anybody else. Remember three people, like he stuffed up, and like, no, he didn't, no, he didn't, no, he didn't, didn't stuff up. He was perfect, he was amazing, he's, he's, he's got it. He goes, ah, I'm not sure, let me watch the video. And so he watched the end part and he was like, oh. When we look at it, it's such a silly little mistake which should not happen. No one was watching his actions. All we were doing was watching him speak, and he wasn't watching his own actions. I was watching him. I didn't notice him putting the same drink in the same cups twice. I didn't believe that he had possibly mixed them up. Uh, and it wasn't until we went backstage and, you know, the remnants of his drinks tasting them, and it, it hit me, and he... It was like, maybe the judges didn't notice. Everyone saw, everyone saw. So two judges will have intensely sweet espresso, intensely sweet signature drink, and the other two judges will have espresso as a signature drink. So that was the year he lost. I was pretty depressed. <laughs> I didn't see him for hours. I think he disappeared, and he was really rattled by that. Yeah. This was another incredibly close competition. These guys are all very experienced. Before announcement, I knew I failed. Well, I've never seen him that broken, very flat. It was hard, hard night ahead and hard day driving back to Canberra. After a while, Jorge Lanza called me and I thought he just wanted to make me feel a little bit better about, you know, how poorly I've done. But then he told me, oh, Sasha, I have some really bad news. The person that is in charge of the farm uh, was keen, um, so we are really in shock. He said that uh, Gerardo was murdered. Yeah, he left two beautiful boys behind and his wife. And while I was serving Gerardo's coffee, uh, yeah, he probably got murdered in that same time. So it's it's a bit. He would not talk to anyone and he, you can see that he's always somewhere else, very distant. I think there was a good period where he just wasn't the same. It took him a, a long time to, to come around to, even the thought of competing to him was something that he was ready to give up. I had no idea what I wanted to do with the comps. Uh, deep in me, yes, I wanted to go I did want to go another year because that sort of gave me an extra strength and another reason if I go and compete, what do I want to talk about? You know, that relationship between the farmers and consumers, that's to me most important in, in this entire coffee chain. He needed what happened in 2014 to make him realise that it's not just about how you speak, it's about everything, it's about being in control and really focus and want to not make any mistakes, just be perfect. And I think it really showed in what he did the following year. He was able to recharge the battery and say, fuck, no. Next year I'll make it much better and I'm gonna win. Now I have opportunity to improve this coffee even further without going back to the farm. So I'm going to highlight sweetness, texture and flavor by using techniques and also ingredients to give you new experience 
Amaya's first story. He did well, but then again, you don't taste coffees. You're just watching for mistakes. You can see technical mistake, maybe, or you can see really bad mistakes, obviously. Then you watch other guys and you go, wow, wow, wow. Well, you know, it's, it's quite impressive in, in finals. And these stunning coffees were perfectly roasted by Brister Champion James Sash and I were both in the finals and we're really hoping one of us would win. Craig Simon. Sasha was looking good to be in the top three. Sasha Sestich and Matt Perger in third place. Matt Perger! Yeah, you usually go, you know, third, second. In second place, Craig Simon! Yeah! At that moment, we knew that's it. <laughs> Winning Australia was something we've always dreamed of. It meant that he'd represent Australia in the World Barista Comp in Seattle. We were travelling in less than four weeks after he won. It feels sort of like everything's about to go pretty crazy. Once we uh, got back, it was straight back into roasting coffee, straight back into rehearsal. There wasn't any time to sit in and really absorb what had, what had happened. From, let's say, 6 o'clock in the morning, he would go to the roastery and practice. As a coffee buyer, I've met so many wonderful producers. He lost a lot of weight. It was a bit scary. He was just drinking coffee the whole time. and He was quite stressed. But he was really focused, like, we, you know, as Kire was advising me, I, I needed to have the entire team. Like. We cannot talk about the Sasa Sestik without talking Kelly, Sam, John Gordon. It's a team effort. It's not a one-man show. It's about 8.30 at night, and I've just finished packaging Sasha's espresso, and I realise that there's more espresso, and there's more espresso, and there's more. And more, and more, and more, and even more. There's a million logistics. Yeah, it's a nightmare. The amount of stuff is just insane. Just think of 16 buddy suitcases worth of stuff. Some of them weren't even suitcases. Some of them were just Kelly and Sash taping foam around metal objects. Eight sets of scales, and we still ended up buying two sets of scales over there. <laughs> two trolleys. You didn't just bring one trolley, you brought two trolleys. Wine glasses, two sets of them. Those pouring jugs for the signature drink, I think three of them. He would have had four Bunsen burners. Little Allen keys, we had screwdrivers, probably about three toothbrushes to clean grinders. We had these little bottles with the grape maceration and the plum reduction, which are for his signature drink. We had like 150, 160 kilograms of coffee ready to go. We've calculated that we can take only, I think about 80 kilograms of coffee, which was very tough. <laughs> <laughs> Sydney Airport was fun because we started going to coffee shops, getting guys. All the reductions, the grape macerations, if we let that get too warm, it would start fermenting. So we had to keep that on ice in thermoses. We divvied it up into our little 50 gram bottles and then stashed them through everyone's bags. The security cameras would have been wondering, what are these people doing? It was risky, but I'm sure the last ones were in his pants, tucked away safely, just in case. He was getting that on the plane no matter what. Some guy in customs at LA pulls out a plum reduction, like plum and panella reduction. He's pulled out this little like travel bottle and he's like, what the hell is this? And I'm like, uh, plums for my face. <laughs> but we 
breeze through. High five the uh, custom guy. The ones that have travelled upstairs have got a slightly better aroma than the ones that are. Oh, yeah. Everything that we did to keep the plum reduction and the great maceration cold was worth it. All the way from Australia to Seattle, so far so good. Top shot. The grinder, no wonder you're having issues. I didn't have issues. I do not believe you cleaned this. I did, for sure. You did not Absolute clean this. Good. You absolutely did not. The amount of money we spent on wood is just ridiculous. Much more better. Should we close that door in case housekeeping goes past and I'm furnishing shit off? I believe that the relationship between the farmer and consumer plays new but very important role in specialty coffee chain. And my inspiration to work with Camilo it's because I, as a barista, want to serve you an amazing coffee. If you made up any mistake and you cannot talk, just pretend it to be normal. Yeah. Right? That gives bad pressure for the judges. Yeah. It was very lucky that we'd been involved with Hide and he'd done this already before. Obviously, you've got confused and upset. You, if you spill or if you like, you're fucked up or whatever on, on the over there or like or the, in front of the machine, and just be normal. Yeah. Don't talk. Right? So if you keep talking like this, you're going to be talking when you make a mistake in the stage. Right? So just be calm and be usual, right? Can we do a full presentation again? Or yeah. you just want to have a signature drink to taste? We can, do, we can do the whole presentation. What do you prefer? Yeah. And such, just Please. keep your tempo, right? Be conscious about your tone voice, yeah. of, of Sorry, your voice. More. I want to see you know, if what's hap what happened if we extract a little bit more. That last little bit in the cup's not very nice. We were trying all these different milks that we bought from the supermarket. None of them worked. Yeah. Some tasted a bit like hay. We even had one that tasted like fish oil capsules. It tastes like fish. This is weird convinced Sash that we're going to find something that's just as good as Australian milk. Like, this is what every other competitor is doing the same thing, let's, let's try it all. Everyone said, you don't need a milk. Like, that milk is probably going to be better than what we have in Australia. But me being me, a little bit stubborn, and uh, uh, I said, no, milk is going with us. I am Sasha's milk mule. You know, it could be worse. At least I'm not his drug mule. You know, I could, um, and I don't have to put it in an uncomfortable place or anything. I just have to put it in my luggage. We decided to fly... Um, Mr. Roland, a couple of days after us. So that he can have milk that's one day fresher, so that when he makes it, hopefully in the finals, he's got, you know, the best milk he can possibly have. This is like the freshest strike. Expiry's the 21st. Okay. Not really your standard package. Fingers crossed I don't get caught. So I'm in the airport and I was umming and ahhing. I'm like, oh, do I tick the box that says I have something to declare? Do I not? So I walk up to the guy and, you know, do you have anything to declare, sir? And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I've, uh, I've got some milk. He's like, milk? I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, he's like, oh, okay. Got a message, hey, he's going through custom, he's safe. We all just started hugging each other. I definitely remember him uh, kissing me. I <laughs> said, so, yes, we're going to have that raspberry candy tasting coffee again, hopefully. These six litres of milk were most precious six litres of milk in my life, and they will ever be most precious three bottles of milk. I think it's good to relax, chill out, and have an awesome day, day tomorrow.
So there's four bananas, and I can't eat more. Fascism is a good look. If you can give the uh, great impression to the uh, judges in the round one, it's going to be great. All right, good? My usual routine with Hire was we sort of hide somewhere from everyone. And now, before routine, we sort of went to loading dock. I started shaking his hand like he's my judge. And then I called time and I started, you know, explaining my routine. And I've just gone blank. I can control my nervousness by myself. It's easy. But I cannot control his nervousness. I've completely lost not only what I need to say, but what I need to do. And then I started sweating and panicking, getting pale. So this is no good. He got upset. So I don't have to handle it. He goes, wow, can he pull this off? So at the end of the day, we will be announcing our 12 semifinalists. All up, there were 52 competitors from you know, 52 different countries around the world. The barista champion of Mexico, everyone, Julieta Vasquez Rivera. She was very nervous. And I'm always worried when they you know, serve the espresso and they're putting it down on the judge's plate and you can hear the clatter. I'm like, <gasps> Hope they don't spill it. Thank you very much. A round of applause for the barista champion of Mexico! Maxwell from the UK just got this like this huge block of ice and he had his little holes drilled in to keep his little flavour things for his signature drink cold. He was definitely one of the strongest competitors. My name is Don Chan and I'm come from Kampeng Room. So the guy from Hong Kong He's busted out for his signature drink. He's got like the dry ice, liquid nitrogen. So he's gone the full like science experiment and there's like, you know, smoke bubbling out of it. It looked amazing. Okay, music first, please. So I was watching the Korean competitor and I was really interested to see how he went because I knew beforehand he didn't speak any English and he had memorized his script. Uh, I'm going to use red katwai and red honey process. So he was doing quite red well. Pressure. All until this point, right at the end, when one of the judges said, you know, you've got one minute left. And he turns back and you can just see it's just gone. And then in the end, he's just like, oh, um, sorry, that's the end of my presentation. Oh. Like backstage, you could see he was just shattered. Yeah, heartbreaking. And then Sasha came in with his performance. The barista champion of Australia, everyone. Uh, Big round of applause for Sasha Sestich. I don't want to be near Sasha, I'm more nervous than he is. I'm just watching everything he does very closely. <laughs> and sleep last night. Doing the two step nervous. You good to go? Beautiful. Time. It is really good to be here with you today. In the last four years, as a barista and the coffee buyer, I've met so many wonderful producers. And together, we shared the ideas and experiments to help improve quality. I think he looked a little bit flustered when he was doing his setup. It was not convincingly um, jumping out. So guys, in these booklets in the front, you'll see information on Camilo, about Camilo and the farm. These booklets are for you to keep, so please, after presentation, take them back with you. I'm going to start with the signature shots, but once again, welcome. I remember him speaking really fast. We were just like, slow down, you're moving too fast. And he looked rushed and moved fast hand movements, all this stuff. Uh, so technical judges, I am going to use my distributing tool today. The hardest part about being there was having the blooming possibility that you're going to put all this effort in and day one you'd go home. Now I'm just going to cool down these signature shots. 
But for now, can you please turn over to page number one in your booklet? And you will see that processing is very unique. Being emotionally involved, you, you hope. You don't look at it rationally, you know, you just want him to go through the first round. So when I combine this milk with my espresso, you're gonna get very creamy mouthfeel. Amazing raspberries and the hint of caramel. And that's my time, thank you very much. Please give it up for the barista champion of Australia, Mr. Sasha Sesti! 20%. We need 80% more. <laughs> We all get a day for announcement of the top 12 semi-final. All right, we're ready to do this. Yes. All right. Our first semi-finalist tomorrow in the 2015 World Barista Championship is the barista champion of the Czech Republic, Adam Neubauer. The niggling feeling the whole time is we're not good enough to be here. Coffee's not good enough, where it too inexperienced. You're competing against the best in the world. John Ryan Singh. <laughs> that was ridiculous. Because we, we weren't completely happy with the first run through. They're calling out all these names and we're just like, oh yeah, God, like, are you serious? He's gonna get bowled out in the first round. The country of Hong Kong, the cupping room. It wasn't said, but you, you could feel it. If Australian competitor doesn't make top 12, it's a little bit disappointing, you know, going back home. The barista champion of Norway, Alexander Hansen. Two spots, one of them goes through, Sasha's still standing there. And one last spot left, there was another, those two, two solid competitors with Sasha standing on the side. And we were just like, oh, come on, like. <laughs> and I said, this is it, you know. It's time to go home. One last final competitor. Thank you, thank you. In some order, representing the country of Australia, Sasha Sestik. Oh, it was crazy, we're jumping out all, all over the place. It was hard because we wanted to be excited about it and he wanted to be excited, but I don't know if everyone knew, he was really unwell. <laughs> I wanted to hide myself because I had no power to talk to anyone. When Sasha is getting ready for comp, he doesn't eat, he doesn't drink, he doesn't sleep, he doesn't do anything but coffee. I'm not sure whether he was aware how exhausted he was. <laughs> we wanted to celebrate, but he was so sick he had to pretty much go back straight to the hotel room. I think he was running on adrenaline. And he said, we have to go to the hospital. And it's like five, six minutes walk. So I said, can you walk for five, six minutes? I couldn't walk. So I was pretty much sitting or lying down while Betty was finding a taxi for me. We jumped in a taxi. We went to the hospital. And that's when he kind of got Absolutely exhausted. He couldn't talk. My temperature was 39.6, low blood pressure, chest infection, virus. They were really worried about my heart conditions. They gave him, I think, two bottles, full bottles, through a trip. And I kind of pulled Betty's arm and I said, Betty, just... Tell them what's happening tomorrow. Tell them to, make, to, to, to get it fixed. Ask them to, to give him some more of this, whatever this is and I knew that he was gonna go and do the semi-finals the next day, even though he couldn't literally walk. So it was just finding a way to explain to these people in the hospital, please get him on his two legs. And all night she was waking up every 40 minutes and an hour giving me different antibiotics and all, all, all these different medications I needed to get my body back in shape, so. To ask the guy yesterday, he goes, uh, will these tablets make me sleepy? And he, got, he goes, no, but you can take these tablets if, if you want to feel sleepy. He goes, no, 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 opposite. Coming from sport, we know how, what can you do injured? You know, we, we know he can still go. I knew he was going to go. He wasn't going to let anything stop him, even if he had to rock up on a wheelchair or, you know, have a cane. 
as long as he can speak and move, he's going to go on. Sasha is hit through the wall. When I woke up in the morning, I felt healthy. I think he was feeling a tiny bit better. I had the best sleep. But his coughing was terrible. <coughs> if we thought he was going to like cough into a judge's face or into a coffee or whatever and croaking to the judges and we were just like, oh no, like this is really, really bad. That was our biggest fear. He felt horrible and, and he looked horrible. You know, we all suggested do not do training run. But didn't go like that. He decided to do full-on practice run. I actually just personally needed to show up to the venue. Everything else was organized by, by a team. Even though when I was dialing the shots, when I was tasting coffees, I've tasted nothing. Semi-finals was dedicated to my entire team. Because they've tasted and they've said, hey, this is what we're tasting, this is what you should say. Now I need to stop talking to everyone for two hours so I can have my voice. And we just hoped he accumulates enough energy for 15 minutes performance. I hate to say it, but this is the last, the 12th competitor in the semifinals for this. The moment he walked out on the stage, I was just two meters away from him with Betty, which is hoping he doesn't collapse. Ladies and gentlemen, Sasha Sestik of Australia. <coughs> oh no. That was too loud, wasn't it? If he keeps coughing to routine, right. we can't call technical timeout. The last four years, as a barista and a coffee buyer, I've met so many. He did everything really slow and spoke to the judges half speed and took, I think, 15 seconds longer. Consumers, which is you today, I needed to do a lot. I was getting that feeling that he is so close to start coughing. And I was like, oh my God. Camilo grows many exotic and rare varietals at his farm. And for you today, I'm serving Sudan Rume. We always had a saying in sports, the moment you're on the court, you're not injured. If you are injured, and if you decide to play it, you're not injured. You're, you're out there, you play. Can I have a time check, please? He cut some parts short, realized running out of time. He missed out one or two details. He got to a signature drink. I think he spilled a little bit when he unscrewed his blender top. And some of that was going all over his board. He was cleaning that up and was behind time. And we're all just like, move. So guys, I would like you to enjoy this drink in two sips. He somehow managed to get through it. I don't know how. He's so strong mentally. Making the presentation that he made in that, uh, in that condition gives to his performance even more value. So please enjoy it. Time. Please give it up for the barista champion of Australia, Mr. Sasha Sestich! Nerve-wracking. I can tell by his music that he's behind time. Whew. And our first finalist and the first competitor tomorrow, from France, Charlotte Marival! From the United Kingdom, Maxwell Colonna Dashwood! United States of America, Charles Babinski. They'd called out number three, and we were all starting to freak out again. He was just like, no, it's fine. He's going to be called out next. Next, Sasha. From Australia, Sasha Sestich. I think he came through as number three, which was still impressive being that sick. It was a good, solid moment of proving yourself, yeah. Thank God that come finals day, he was feeling 85% better than what he was. It's still a bit croaky and we're like, no, no, you're almost normal. We decided to use a better roast of his cap coffee. It was smelling amazing. So he was like, all right, we'll chuck this through first. Ran the shot and was like, yeah, yeah this will be good. Let's just taste that. And it was just like one of the best milk bases I've ever tasted in my life. Amazing. This is raspberry Man, And then Sasha was like, yeah, cool, we're done. And we're like, you don't want to try your other one? And he's like, no, 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 this is good. We'll just do this. 
we're like, okay, let's do espresso. He poured one espresso and was just like, yep, that's better than yesterday. We're done. That espresso was, it was like sherbet acidity. It was like sparkling, like mixing tartaric with citric with sugar and then dried apricots and it was an amazing espresso. <laughs> they are so good. We look back and every time we try a new coffee or a single origin, we go, were they as good as WBC finals day? Give it up. After all this once, today is the day. I was a little bullying about today's things, right before this practice, but oh, bro, my mind. I don't have to worry alone. And much more better. Much, much more better. Much, much more better. champion of Australia, Mr. Sasha Sestik! As I was looking around the crowd, I said, well, yeah, it's my time to shine and it's my time to sort of introduce myself to specialty coffee world best way I can. Okay, so... Shall we have music, please? Right from his first sentence, and it is really good to be here. You could just see that he was ready to do it, he was focused. It is really good to be here with you again. <laughs> so in the last four years, as a barista and also coffee buyer, I've met so many wonderful producers. It's the only time I've ever, in the entire time being with Sash, that I've actually managed to watch him and feel like he's in full control. Yeah, goosebumps watching you. So guys, coffee I'm serving today is from Camilo Marisande from Colombia. He built this unique greenhouse system to protect these coffee trees from UV rays. We managed to get 4% more sugars in this system comparing with the Latino common shade. And that's what's gonna give you more sweetness in your espresso. He was talking, looking at them, making eye contacts whenever he called. While he was grinding, he was looking across, are they okay? It was, it was brilliant, like he was the least nervous guy in the room. Our processing is very unique. And that's because we call this process Bosch Carbonic Maceration. And I drew my inspiration from winemakers. I've never seen him deliver something so passionately and so controlled and like, this is my stage sort of thing. Lately, I've been loving this very fruity natural process cappuccinos. So what I've done is I blended 50% of natural process Sudan Rome, 50% of Bosch carbonic maceration process. So when I combine this milk with my espresso, you're gonna get very creamy mouthfeel. Raspberry candy and hint of white chocolate. I think this coffee is just delicious. Seattle, let's hear you take the roof off for the cappuccino! When he got to the signature drink, we're like, all he has to do is just finish this and he's done it. He was in control. If one of the judges dropped the glass, I think he will catch it on there. He was that, that, that much into it. So back in Australia, in a local winery, I've done carbonic maceration with the wine grapes. I've pressed them in a stainless container. Then I moved the container to below five degrees just to make sure that we don't produce any alcohol. We ended up with this amazing liquid. When I add five milliliters of this Shiraz grape to four shots of my espresso, you're gonna get this amazing raspberries. He wasn't just running through the process, you know, he generally wanted to get his message across to the judges and, and tell them about this coffee and what he'd done. I've selected the black plums, which I have reduced with a panela sugar, just to highlight that stone fruit sweetness of my espresso. I've also slightly heated this reduction, just to emphasize the aromatics. I'm adding 10 grams of ice. I'm gonna put this entire drink through this high RPM blender that's gonna give us that nice creamy texture. Believe it or not, I actually watched all six competitors. I thought, it's not because he's my husband, but come on, like he nailed it. I would like you to enjoy this drink in two sips. So in the first sip, you're gonna get this amazing creamy mouthfeel. But then in the second sip, we're looking for sparkling acidity, raspberries, and the stone fruits. 
I believe that the relationship between a farmer and consumer plays new but very important role. And my inspiration to work with Camilo is because I, as a barista, want to serve you an amazing coffee. So on behalf of Camilo and myself, please enjoy it. Thank you. Let's give it up for the barista. I've actually clapped to myself as well. <laughs> I, I was just emotionally happy. As well. This was so good. Sasha Sesti! I knew that this is the best presentation I've done ever. Regardless, finish number six in the finals or number one, I knew that this was my best shot and I could not do, possibly do anything better than what I've done in the finals. Yesterday, our top 12 semi-finalists competed. And this afternoon, our top six finalists also completed their routines. And right now, we're getting ready to announce our champion. Now we come to the business end of the things and, and somebody's gonna win. It's time to get some baristas out here, I think, because it is a barista competition. I'm stressed. <laughs> So in the order that I competed today, please, will you put your hands together for the barista champion of France, Charlotte Malava! Of course, any one of those six can win. I think Maxwell's third time in the final, top six. Sasha's first for him. You have to look at who he has to beat to win. It was scary to hope. It's either going to be all the way on the top, or it's going to be number six, because maybe there was this big mistake that I haven't noticed. And I had a fear of that big mistake because I've done something similar here before in Australian Barista Comp. And then they started. <laughs> in sixth place, the barista champion of... Let's hope it's not Sasha. Let's just get through six and be okay. France! Charlotte Melville! After, you know, they announced Charlotte for number six, I actually had a bit of breathing space. I felt that I might be somewhere in the top three. In fifth place, the barista champion of the United Kingdom, Maxwell Colonna Dashwood! In fourth place, the barista champion of Hong Kong, Dawn Chan Khan Hu! Somehow number four happened without even us realizing that Sasha is still standing there. And the moment you turn around, it was top three. It was Charles Babinski, Ben Putz, and Sasha. Congratulations, guys, first of all, on making top three. And in third place... You just hope it's not, it's not Sasha. The barista champion of... Canada! Ben Put! So then they announced Ben Put is number three. This is when I freaked out. Absolute. Uh, completely, like I just had this energy going from my thoughts to my head and this excitement and scare and the cold sweat. I was feeling so sick. I just so wanted him to win. I was just, you know, shaking like uh, when you are minus 20 degrees. There was Sasha and Charles Wapinski. This is so close. And they decided to call, obviously, number two first. In second place, the barista champion of... And they paused for ages. Oh, come on, like... It was just like waiting for 
what was to come next. Couldn't say it any slower. The barista champion off, and he's standing there and goes. The United States of America, Charles Babinski! A little bit rude, all of us, because we jumped out of the job. We didn't wait for, for announcement to say that Sasha actually won. And I'm thinking, is this a dream? Am I World Barista Champion? And the winner of the World Barista Championship 2015, Sasha Sesti! <laughs> Seeing Hire coming over with the trophy, and I just hugged him. I, I could not stop hugging him. I think poor guy probably had a bruises. Thank you.